Your homework is to memorize this and write it 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, hippest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Pulley. This week on Brain Stew, we ship off to the Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia to learn all about the ill-fated ocean liner Titanic. Titanic sank in the North Atlantic in April of 1912. How did the unsinkable sink? We'll tell you. Almost 90 years later, this tremendous ship still rests two miles underwater. So what's the big deal about a ship that sank after the turn of the century? Well, Brain Stew will let you see what it was like to be aboard the luxury ocean liner Titanic before it sank. Hey you guys, welcome to Brain Stew. I'm Jennifer Pulley. Today, we are turning back the clock 86 years. Now, try to imagine with me, if you will, your life without video games, ah! TV, VCR, no cell phones. Oh, stop, stop. Could it be? Life used to be like that. I know it's hard to imagine, but 86 years ago, those things just hadn't been invented yet. Okay, let's think about the year 1912 for a minute. Hmm, well, we, we all know the things that they didn't have in 1912, like all the cool stuff. But what are some things they had? What are some things that had been invented? Well, people had to get around, right? It's called transportation. What about cars? Yeah, they did have cars in 1912. Not like the cars that we have today, but they did have cars. Jumbo jets, nah, only a fantasy. If people wanted to get from, say, Europe to New York City, across the ocean, no jumbo jets. They had to go by boat. Okay, okay, so you, are you dying to know? What does all this have to do with the year 1912? Let me tell you. Well, Wednesday, April the 10th, 1912, was important in history because it was the day the Titanic set sail. Departing Southampton Dock, hey, that's in England. She stopped in France, Ireland, and then headed on her maiden voyage to New York City. The Titanic was the largest ship built at its time. It reached three football fields in length, and it was over 12 stories high. She topped the scales, at an amazing 46,000 tons. Whew. An estimated 2,200 people bought tickets to go aboard Titanic. Now what happened five days later in the early morning hours of April 15, 1912 made history. Why? Well, the ship, many thought was unsinkable, hit an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on Sunday, April 14, 1912. Tragically, the Titanic sank to the bottom of the North Atlantic, where she still rests today. More than 1,500 lives were lost. So, so how can we learn about this great ship, Titanic, when it's almost two miles underwater? Well, the Mariner's Museum here in Newport News, Virginia, has invited Brain Stew aboard its recreation of the steamship, Titanic. The boat's about to leave, Jen, so it's time to take our tickets and get on board. You guys, that's my friend Claudia. She has our ticket to go aboard the largest man-made vessel of its time. Claudia, uh, how much do I owe you for the ticket? Uh, that'll be $43.50. Oh, okay, I got that. You take checks? $43.50, that's not bad. That's $4,350. Whoa, that's a lot of dough for a boat ride. Yeah. You guys, today, this same ticket would cost $50,000. You thought $4,350 was a lot? $50,000, woo, imagine. So let's get on board. Okay, you guys, hold on as we go back in time 86 years to the year 1912. Oh, okay, that's enough realism. We need some color here. Much better. Let's go. Claudia, I, Madeline Astor, and you are? Margaret Brown. What's the importance of names on the tickets? Well, these are actual passengers who had booked the maiden voyage of Titanic. So everyone who enters the exhibit gets to choose a ticket, and the ticket has a name of someone who was actually on that first trip. Wow, and I guess we find out at the end if they survived. That's right. We're going to New York. We've got our ticket. Uh, you know, I have to ask you, what's the big deal about Titanic? I mean, they've been, they have a movie made of it. What's the big deal? Why is it so important? People love the Titanic, and it's the whole mystery of the ship. It was the largest moving object built in 1912. It cost $7.5 million to make this ship back in those days. 
That's a lot of money now. Think about how much it was back then. That's incredible. It was the first quality experience. It was the best that money could buy. Okay, Chloe, uh, largest man-made object, you said, of its time. Who built this? The ship was built for the White Star Line, and the White Star Line had some of the largest and most luxurious ships right about the turn of the century. And the way people traveled at the turn of the century is very different from how they travel today. Women spent a lot of time just changing clothes. One woman actually brought on board 19 trunks, such as you see right here. And I thought I was a bad packer. <laughs> Women wore dresses like mine, and they changed clothes 14, 15 times a day. A day? A day. Wow. Now, Claudia, what type of people were going aboard Titanic um, in April of 1912? All kinds of people. It was everything from John Jacob Astor, who was the richest passenger on was board. Was that my husband? That's your husband. Madeline Astor, that's my husband, okay. Uh, and I'm Margaret Brown, who is known as Molly Brown, and we'll see her in just a minute. She became known as the unsinkable Molly Brown because she survived this wreck. She wasn't as big as the Titanic, though, was she? No. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, you just gotta we're first-class passengers, but on Titanic, there were many different kinds of people traveling. The first-class passengers, like this family that you see right here, were probably coming back from Europe. They had a nice time. They might have been returning to the United States with the latest clothes from Paris. Uh, they'd had a nice time on enjoying vacation, themselves. Right, Absolutely, they were on vacation. You'd also meet families like this. These are third class passengers, and they could have been traveling from Ireland or Italy. Right and they would have been bringing all their possessions because they were emigrating to the United States. So they had all their hopes and all their good intentions ready to start a new life. Hey, there I am, hat and all. That's right. <laughs> you are the young Mrs. Astor, and because you were traveling with your husband, John Jacob Astor, the richest man on board, <laughs> you were able to get into one of the lifeboats. But even though he was the richest man on board, he stood back and allowed women and children to go first. How noble. And he drowned. Uh, this watch belonged to him, along with these cufflinks, and the watch was actually recovered when they found his body after the Titanic had gone down. And it has his initials on it. It has his initials. Is that how they knew that it was his? That's how they knew it was John Jacob mm -hmm. Astor. Hey, Claudia, I, I found another watch here. Does this one work? No, Jen, this one does not work because this watch belonged to a second-class passenger named Robert Douglas Norman. And he actually had a life jacket on. He was standing there, and he saw a woman who didn't have a life jacket. And he took off his life jacket and said, take this life jacket. I'm a strong swimmer. I'll be all right. Well, of course, it didn't make any difference if he could swim or not because the water was so cold. When he jumped into the water, the watch stopped, and the hands are frozen and rusted to the exact time 116. that his body hit the icy waters of the Atlantic. 116, that is frozen in time? Frozen in time, exactly. Claudia, you've told me a little bit of history about Madeline Astor. You're Margaret Brown. Who was Margaret Brown? Margaret Brown is a very interesting character. In fact, she's standing right here at the table. Hey, Margaret. And she becomes known as the unsinkable Molly Brown because she survives the Titanic. This is a beautiful little Egyptian uh, figurine, and she had been in Europe traveling, gone to Egypt, and had acquired a lot of Egyptian antiquities to bring back to Denver. Well, the crates that were in storage all went down with Titanic. Mm -hmm. But this little figurine, she liked, and she had held it in her hand. And she held it in her hand while she was on the lifeboat, put it in her pocket, and she said, it was my good luck charm. It's what saved me. And when she was rescued by the Carpathia, she took this little figurine and gave it to the captain of the rescue ship. She did? So this little figurine comes to us from ancient Egypt, but it comes to us by way of Titanic. First class was the bomb. That's the place to be. First class was the place to be, <laughs> but even the second and third class accommodations on Titanic were better than anyone had ever seen before. This is a dining room in the second class, and it's really very beautiful. Sure. And here's a piece of china that would have been used in the There's second the class There's the white star cabin. line again. And even though they didn't have 11 course dinners like they did in first class, they had very, very good service and food, and most people felt that second class aboard Titanic was better than first class on any other ship. So tell me a little bit about third class. 
Well, usually when people traveled third class, they didn't expect much. In fact, they often had to bring all their own food because it was just a ride from one place to another and they were just cargo. Yeah. But Titanic was very luxurious. This is the third class dining room. And the third class also had several choices for food. They had people who served them their dinners. And it really was the best third class passage that you could find. Wow. So, I mean, anywhere you were on Titanic, you were just, you were really lucky to be on You were lucky. People were very excited to be on board this ship. Wow. Now, we talk about the Titanic being a steamship. Um, what does that mean? I mean, what, what powered Titanic? Titanic was powered by coal and they had stokers who were the people that actually picked up the coal and threw it into the furnaces to get the power for the show. Oh, can you tell me about that? I know someone who can tell you about that. Coming up next, we finish our tour of Titanic. Plus, we meet a man who will tell us what it was like to be a worker aboard the Titanic in 1912. Don't jump ship just yet. Still 1912, and we are aboard Titanic. I'm with my buddy Chris. How you doing, Chris? Oh, not too bad. Uh, Chris, what? Uh, you, you look so different from Claudia. I mean, she was all dressed to the hilt, and you, you know, you, well, you course, got some dirt on. Right, I noticed that. Yeah. Well, of course, Claudia's <laughs> first-class passenger. She's on this vessel. She's having the time of her life. Uh -huh. But somebody has to do the work, and I'm representing the fireman. I'm in charge of keeping the boilers up, burning the coal, making the ship steam, basically. What power the Titanic? It's a steam vessel. Uh, basically, what you're looking at this diagram of the ship. All this colored portion you're seeing up here is where the passengers are. This is where Claudia's cabin would have been. That's the first class, right? Right, first class area. Yeah. But for the firemen, this is where we live, in the very bottom of the ship, actually below the water line. There were 29 boilers aboard the machine. And boilers, what that literally means is we're burning coal that's going to boil water. And of course, as everybody knows, when you boil water, it turns into steam. That's exactly right. The steam right. expands, and that expanding steam is what drives the ship. So you're telling me the Titanic ran on water? Exactly. This is wow. a water-driven ship. Wow. Up here, you're seeing some photographs of the boilers these are the size of the boilers. They're 15 foot in diameter. They were enormous with three furnaces on either side. So this is where actually I'll be shoveling that coal in. Is that what this is? Well, actually what I have here is what's called a fireman's hoe. And this is actually used to smooth the fires inside. The fires have to be put out very quickly. I can sling open up these furnaces and use this hole and actually drag the coal out and rake it out onto the deck. The deck steals so it's not going to burn. The steam not only drives the ship, it also lights the ship because there's electric dynamos aboard the ship that that expanding steam will be fed into that spins the dynamos to create the electricity. And it's important to keep the electricity up even as the ship is sinking because the lights are what the rescue ships are going to see and the electricity is powering the radio to send out the distress signals. But literally, the firemen keep the lights aboard the ship up until literally just a few minutes before it goes under. These men, it's, it's simply heroic. There's 185 firemen aboard this ship and only 60 of them get off. Most of them stayed at their stations because they knew it was essential if anybody was going to get off this vessel to stay in place. How long did it take for the Titanic to sink after it hit the iceberg? It was about two hours and 20 minutes. Not very long when you have to make that decision whether or not to save your own life. There was a a tradition at sea, it wasn't the law, but a tradition at sea that it was women and children first. And so a lot of them standing there, do you want to separate from your family? And as we know, some families decided, some couples decided that they'd rather go down together. together. So you had a very short period of time to make a decision that would affect the rest of your life. And this is an amazing picture of it. Right, this and is they see the lights still on. Again, because the firemen stayed at their station to keep the steam so up. Well. Yes. We're very proud of that. <laughs> We've been talking about this luxurious ocean liner. Um, I guess the tragedy of the whole thing is that it did sink. Why did the Titanic see the iceberg? Well, it was an incredibly clear, flat, calm night. The water, there was hardly a ripple. And there were lookouts on the mast aboard Titanic, and they were trying to see what was ahead of them. But because the night was so calm, the iceberg was just sitting there. There was no surf, there was no rippling, there was no foam. So they didn't see it until the ship was practically right upon it. And of course, one of the things about icebergs is they're not just on top of the water. Often the biggest part of them is underneath. So as Titanic tried to, to pull around the iceberg, the bigger part of the iceberg that they didn't see on the surface rubbed the ship. 
Now, Claudia, you're talking about them seeing the iceberg, so that means they're relying on their sight. Absolutely. What else, didn't they rely on like radar or something to see these icebergs in the ocean? Jen, we're back in 1912. There oh, was yeah. no radar. I there was forgot. there was no sonar. There was no global positioning. No. Nothing. In fact, the Titanic had one of the most modern forms of communication, which was this wireless telegraph. And they were able to send out messages from the Titanic to other ships and to land without any wires. Now, we're so used to using cell phones yep. and car phones <laughs> that it's hard to imagine in 1912, this was absolutely cutting edge technology because Titanic was getting messages from other ships that were so far away she couldn't even see them. And she was sending out messages to ships she couldn't see. It was absolutely the newest thing possible. Did Titanic send an SOS when they hit the iceberg? They actually did send a distress call and in fact here's a Marconi log from a ship that was listening to Titanic and it records everything Titanic said which was I require assistance immediately struck by iceberg. It says it right there. And this ship that is receiving this was 500 miles away so it was too far to help but yet you see the letters SOS and this was one of the first times SOS was used for a distress call. What does SOS mean? It isn't that it means anything, but it was an easy code to send. It was three dots, three dashes, and three dots. Claudia, I'm a little confused. I don't understand why more than half of the passengers aboard Titanic perished if they had lifeboats like the one we're getting into in Life Vest. Well, unfortunately, Jen, they did not have enough lifeboats for all the passengers on board. You and I are lucky, we're first class passengers, so we got a seat in a lifeboat. Those boats would accommodate half the people who were actually on Titanic. Now another problem was that when people were told to get into lifeboats, the Titanic was sinking, they didn't believe it. And many women said, I'm not getting in that small little boat, I'll just stay here until we're rescued. They didn't, they didn't realize that it was gonna sink. They didn't realize, they just refused to believe the Titanic was going down. And these are, these don't look like uh, the, life, the orange life vests that we have today. No, these are very early life vests, and in those days they made life vests out of cork. Oh, it's hard. So it's hard, right. Most of the people who went into the water when Titanic went down floated, but that didn't save them. The unfortunate thing is the water was 28 degrees, and 28 degree water will kill you from exposure. You so hyperthermia is what Hyperthermia. So a lot of people didn't, most of the people that perished did not drown? They were frozen. That's really yeah. tragic. That's yeah. really sad. But the good that came out of it was immediately they decided that every boat would have enough life vests and lifeboats for all the passengers and all the crew. And that every boat, every ship would have lifeboat drills so you would know where you were supposed to go, which boat you were to report to. The other thing was that they decided the Marconi room, the telegraph room, uh -huh. would be operated 24 hours a day because sometimes they'd just go to sleep and then they would never get messages. <laughs> so That's what you call sleeping on the job. Good things oh. happen from this <laughs> That's tragedy. That's good, I, yeah, it, it is a tragedy, but I always want to point out the good that came of it. That's right. We're at the end of the exhibit. What do we do with our tickets now? Well, now we need to take our tickets to the book at the very end which will tell us if we survived or we were lost with the ship. You're, you're Aster, so you ABC you're, order. Mm -hmm. My husband, correct? There's John your husband. Mm -hmm. And there I am. And this is John are. Jacob. I was 19, first class, and I was saved. And your husband was 47, first class, and he was lost. And Brown. Mother Brown. Brown. Mother Mrs. Brown. Mrs. James Margaret. 44 you years old. I was married, but I was traveling alone. My husband was back in Denver, and I was also saved. First class and you were saved. Oh, well, Claudia, or Molly Brown, I really want to thank you so much for this tour through Titanic. I've learned so much information, and I now realize why Titanic is so important, and it will last in our memory forever. Well, I'm glad you survived, <laughs> so you can tell this story to others. I will, I will. Thank you so much. Hey, You're guys, welcome. don't go away. What made the Titanic? This huge ship float. I mean, it was so heavy. We're going to go and try an experiment that will answer that question. Plus, we visit the library. You won't believe what you can find on the 86-year-old Titanic. We'll be right back.
How does a heavy ship like the Titanic float? Let's find out. Here's what you need for this simple experiment. A bowl of water, a ruler, 20 paper clips, a leading foil, and a pair of scissors. Got it? Good. Now here's the procedure. Step one, cut two 12-inch squares from the aluminum foil. Step two, place 10 of the paper clips into one of the squares and squeeze into a tight ball. Fold the four edges of the other aluminum square into a small pan like this. Step four, place the other 10 paper clips into the metal pan. Hang on, we're almost there. Next, place the metal dish into the bowl of water. Last but not least, hey, stop snoozing. Oh, yeah, Place the metal ball into the bowl of water. Whoa, check out these results. The metal ball sinks and the pan floats. Why did this happen? Well, I'll tell you. The ball and pan both have the same weight, but the ball takes up a smaller space than the pan does. The amount of water pushed away by an object equals the force of water pushing up on an object. The ball pushes less water out of its way than the larger pan does, so there is not enough upper force to cause it to float. Large ships, like the Titanic, are very heavy, but they have hollow compartments filled with air, which increases their buoyancy. Well, that's brain stew for this week. I'm glad we all survived our trip back in time to visit the Titanic here at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Even though it's been 86 years, the tragedy of the Titanic still captures our curiosity and stirs our imagination. Okay, kitchen sink, okay, I think I've got everything. I'm all packed up and I'm ready to go. They're shipping me off on another brain stew adventure. Until next time, keep your brain stewing. Captain Smith? <laughs> 2,200 people, about, bought tickets to go aboard Titanic. Now what happened? What if you wanted to go from, say, Europe to, to New York City? Well, the only way to travel... Well, that's our... See? Well, that's brain stew for this week. Even though 86 years have passed since the sinking of the Titanic... Nope. 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 Even though 86 years have passed since...